Okay, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you today to an event entitled The Multiple Manifestations of Hindu Buddhist Gods, Encore, and the Dynamics of Art History. Um, I want to thank all of you who made it to SOAS today. It's a, it's a balmy June day. You could be doing other things. Um, and I, I really appreciate your, your being here and making this event possible as well. Um, I also want to thank our funders and our hosts, the Alpha Wood Foundation funded Southeast Asian Art Academic Program at SOAS and the SOAS Center for Southeast Asian Studies. This is our final event in the 2017-2018 event series on Southeast Asian art and archaeology. Uh, this brings to an end this year's series, which is the culmination of four years, in fact, of um, a running program on South and Southeast Asian art and archaeology that is run through the center and funded by the SAP program. Uh, over the, this four-year period, we've tried to develop a two-pronged approach to the event program. So as some of you will know, in the first two terms, we have um, an invited speaker series. And then in term three, when both staff and students, well, let me say, <laughs> I wanted to say when staff and students have more time, that's not quite true, unfortunately. But when we're not as tied, to the uh, teaching rhythm, let's put it that way. We're all doing our independent work and our independent marking. Um, we organize more substantial research events, which I've been calling workshops. So this is, this is one of those. Um, and in these events, we try to bring together uh, multiple scholars, often who come from, dis from different disciplines. Um, and we try to work on specific themes that are of importance uh, within the field of Southeast Asian art and archaeology today. Um, so the, the, the ambition here, or the goal, in running this series is also twofold. Uh, in the first instance, we very basically uh, seek to promote research in the field uh, with a particular orientation to supporting Southeast Asian scholars themselves in developing and in disseminating research. Um, secondly, we aim, and this is the more ambitious aim perhaps, although the first is also ambitious in other ways, we aim to examine in a much more synthetic fashion the, the state of the field um, of Southeast Asian art and archaeology um, with a particular orientation here to supporting reflection on methodologies in the field. So that's, that's the big picture. Um, so the collaborative workshop format is designed really to enable us to reach, uh, in particular, this latter goal. So more broadly, with this two-pronged approach, the Center for Southeast Asia, for Southeast Asian Studies program, seeks to align the SAP research remit with its more practical dimensions of enabling development of work on the region by regional scholars, while nonetheless, and this is quite important to us and I think visible in our events, while nonetheless um, refraining from essentializing um, a Southeast Asian scholar or what is a Southeast Asian scholar, um, that is while, while uh, really very proactively recognizing the international uh, nature of Southeast Asian scholars today, as well as the necessity and the very complex nature of international exchange at the heart of the field. So another way to, to speak SOAS talk at the moment, uh, we seek to um, align our specific work on Southeast Asian art and archaeology with a broader and very, um, very, uh, shall I say, potent uh, directive or orientation at the university today, imperative is perhaps the right, the right term, um, on decolonizing scholarship um, in and on what we call our regions. Um, so let me just um, say a few practical words on the means by which we seek to reach these, these uh, relatively uh, lofty goals. Uh, the research and publication subgroup of the Southeast Asian Art Academic Program is currently launching, launching two publishing initiatives. First of all, a postgraduate research journal, which is called Ratu, 
This is co-edited by a group of SOAS PhD candidates. I will name them for their valor in doing this. Heidi Tan, Ben Rayford, Udomlo Kuntrakun, and uh, Duyen Nguyen. And we are also launching a book series within US Press, which is entitled Southeast Asian Art and Archaeology, Hindu Buddhist Traditions. So the journal and the book series each are meant to provide a substantial new forum for disseminating the highest quality research in the field. Now, a number of us who are participating in today's event are additionally involved in what are now long established Cambodian based publishing ventures. Professor Ong Chulian and I are co founders and editors of Udaya, a journal of Khmer studies. This is a trilingual academic journal which is born out of our joint work with the Cambodian government at Angkor and at Phnom Penh's Royal University of Fine Arts. And this is a journal devoted to Khmer studies at large. Professor Ong is also the founder and director of Yasato, a Phnom Penh based NGO which is devoted to supporting research and publishing in Khmer studies and notably in the Khmer language. Um, Yasato today publishes both Udaya Journal of Khmer Studies and Khmer Renaissance, which is an online Khmer language Khmer studies journal. Now Yasato runs on charitable donations and on the voluntary work of a very hearty group of Cambodian scholars, including a number of those who are currently undertaking postgraduate research here at um, or postgraduate degrees here at SOAS and who are uh, in the audience. Um, Dr. Grégory Michelion, um, our second speaker, he and I have joined with uh, members of the European Cambodian diaspora to found and to run a French based association which is devoted to supporting Yasator's work and we call ourselves the Friends of, of Yasato. So, following our discussions um, and our talks today, we warmly invite you to a reception down the hall in 211, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where we will be providing information about these initiatives uh, in the UK, in Singapore, uh, in Cambodia, in France, and indeed in the virtual transnational world, which is the internet and we will also be holding a book sale. Um, we will also be offering drinks. Um, so please do, please do come for a browse and for a drink after, after the, the formalities today. Now I want to um, turn to our speakers, first of all to thank them all for having traveled far and wide. We have people from different reaches of the world, if not of the universe today. Um, and I want to thank you all also for having uh, already given significant amount of, amounts of time and thought to making the event uh, worthwhile for all of us today. So um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of back work behind this. I will also thank uh, someone who's not in the room, who is Charles Taillandier, who uh, is making it all happen logistically from the center, and of course Liam Roberts uh, from the SAP program, who is really behind the uh, very efficient organization of, um, of these series. So they have done a lot to make this happen, and our speakers and our respondents have put in a significant amount of work to be with us here today, and to begin to collaborate and discuss with each other already the topics that we will be um, presenting and opening up um, with all of you. So um, I should say that our workshop today and I'm very proud to say this, it brings together a group of the most outstanding scholars of Cambodian art history, archaeology, cultural and political history, and anthropology. Um, presenting new research at the nexus of these disciplines, um, our two speakers will lend their work to addressing the deep and necessary questions at the heart of the field of Southeast Asian art and archaeology today. And I will now quote from um, the original conception behind this workshop um, with these questions. How does art serve to sustain cultural dynamics over centuries? How is it caught, transformed, and carried by forces more powerful than any given work? What has driven the staying power of Indic gods in Southeast Asian contexts? Through close consideration of particular works of art and image types, along with the evolving architectural, textual, and ritual context in which these objects are embedded, our speakers examine the work of art in long-term historical processes. 
Um, and as we will see, if Encore is our point of departure and return, Encore repeatedly propels us to transcend its apparent temporal and spatial limits. Um, I would add also that just in coming out of a lunchtime conversation with our group of scholars today, I think there is very rich material in the work that will be presented to think very broadly, but also quite specifically, uh, relations between the material and the immaterial, between the object and perhaps the idea or what we think it is that we call relation. So that's the big picture. Now let me um, just give formal introductions to our speakers. Ong Chulian is Professor of Religious Anthropology and Epigraphy at the Department of Archaeology, Royal University of Fine Arts. He is the director, as I said, of the Yasatoa Cultural Institute in Phnom Penh. Professor Ong is renowned for his profoundly insightful anthropological work, uniquely grounded in and shedding light on Cambodian and broader regional historical, art historical, and linguistic contexts. He is also renowned for his commitment to teaching. I think we have ample uh, demonstration of uh, the appreciation and of the, the impact of his pedagogical work um, over decades now here in the room today. Uh, he delivers lectures and seminars to researchers and cultural heritage managers at the National Museum of Cambodia, at the APSRA Authority for Managing Encore, this above and beyond the regular lectures and seminars that he delivers at in the regular program at the department, both at, in the regular undergraduate program in the Department of Archaeology at the Royal University of Fine Arts in Phnom Penh. I think that many people in this room would support me in saying that he, more than anybody else, has uniquely shaped the experience of students of art and archaeology in and on Cambodia, and I include, include myself in that, over nearly three decades now. Grégory Michelion is a full-time researcher with the Parisian CNRS and collaborates with colleagues to deliver an important interdisciplinary seminar on Cambodian historical, cultural, and linguistic phenomena at the École des Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris. He is a leader amongst a younger generation of Cambodian scholars. He is an outstanding historian whose work has profoundly changed understandings of Cambodian historical and cultural landscapes from the 17th century on, and he is increasingly key to the scholarly development of postgraduate students working between France and Cambodia in joint training programs held between the Royal University of Fine Arts and a number of Parisian institutions of higher learning. We are very sorry to let you know that his co-author, Eric Bourdonneau, who is an accomplished art historian of the École Française d'Extrême-Orient and who is based in Siembriep, is actually unable to join us in person today. He is nonetheless more than present in spirit, having co-authored the presentation which Greg will single-handedly deliver. I am also delighted to welcome our panel of respondents. These include SOAS postgraduate student Conan Chong and professors Penelope Edwards and Vasuda Narayanan. I will introduce our respondents in greater detail before, um, before the roundtable discussion. Um, let me just tell you now how we will organize our format for today. Uh, we will have our two speakers first. Uh, I warn you in advance. I ask them to speak for 45 minutes or so, so they will be substantial presentations. Uh, we may stretch our legs between the one and the other, but we won't have a, uh, we won't have a real break, a real pause. Uh, we will then, after the two talks, we will break up to organize ourselves for the round table, maybe a 10 minute break for everybody to, to um, do what they need to do to be prepared to go into the afternoon session. And then our three respondents um, who have had sight of the materials prior to, prior to the presentations today will be responding to the papers and then we will open it up to the, to the full group. So uh, please bear with us. I realize many of you um, from, from talk one on to talk two will have questions that you want to pursue immediately. Please do note those down. Please do, please do keep those and bring them to the discussion uh, towards uh, as, we, as we open up the round table. All right, so that's, um, that's where we will be heading. I think that is all I have to say, so please join me in welcoming, first of all, Professor Ong Chulian. Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> you know, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my thanks, my deep thanks to the 
the Center for Southeast Asian Study, to Ashley, to all the organizers of this session. Uh, the title of my talk here may not reflect entirely the, the point I wish to uh, develop. Uh, dealing with uh, Yama, uh, Yama of course is the god of the death, S as uh, death relates to rebirth. I would like to put the stress upon the second dimension of this uh, god, of the idea of rebirth, of renaissance, of cycle of time. Uh, so it is about the Yama, a very uh, special god. Uh, can I sit down? Yes. Uh, he is a uh, quite a special god because, uh, by definition, god ignores death. The god, all the gods are immortal except. Uh, Yama. Yama is the only one who has experienced death among the God. And uh, his story uh, the roughly goes like this. Um, in the beginning, there was no time, there was no darkness, only light. And there was no, of course, there was no human being, just God associated with light. Uh, once more, uh, this special god has, uh, Yama has a twin sister called Yami. And uh, one day, I, I should not uh, say one day because there was no time, but uh, once he died, and uh, which left <coughs> Uh, the, the twin uh, sister uh, which left uh, Yami in a deep sorrow and she uh, cries endlessly uh, and all the god, the other god come to see her asking her this question why uh, do you cry? she say uh, because my brother dies when yesterday, uh, today, I'm sorry. And she continued crying incessantly. And a long time after, the, 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 all the God come back asking the same question, why do you cry? And she answered, because my brother died. Uh, when? Today. And uh, this uh, sequence just repeat and repeat without uh, an end. And uh, finally, the God uh, decide to create night. So they create night so that you can have time from now on. Because uh, night uh, and day just alternate in uh, endless uh, cycle. And from then on, we can uh, talk about time. And so you, you, we can see that the Yama is at the origin of time. Uh, Yami uh, cried, of course, but in a lesser degree, the, the, the God come asking the question, why do you cry? He say, uh, because my brother died. When? Yesterday. And after that, uh, the, the, uh, and the, the sorrow goes down and down uh, to uh, eventually uh, fade away completely. And uh, as we know, uh, time is the, uh, the, the, the factor which wears out everything. So from then on, time exists, thanks to Yama, if, uh, if uh, I may say so. This is the, the, the story of uh, Yama. From ancient Cambodia, you have uh, 
a number of sculptures, some standing, uh, freestanding sculpture like this. But the, in that case, we do not know the exact uh, original position because, uh, because all the chatu are no more in situ. Uh, we, we do not know uh, the, the why I say this, because Yama is the associated to the south. He is the guardian of the south direction, the region of the south. We can only guess that uh, in its original uh, um, location, situation, maybe this uh, statue uh, faced the uh, west, uh, south direction. He is the region of the south. This is the uh, central tower of Phnom Bakain. Phnom Bakain is a huge complex in Ongo area. And at the top of the hill, you can see this tower. And uh, you cannot see clearly, but uh, in the center of this pediment, this is the detail of it. You can see Yama on his bu buffalo. The buffalo is the vehicle, uh, classical vehicle of uh, Yama. And uh, the, the pediment is facing south, exactly conform to uh, Indian tradition. We are in 10th century. This is from the Mebon, on, uh, also 10th century. The Mebon, you can see Yama on, this is a, a central part of a lintel. Uh, Yama on his buffalo facing south. One, one lintel in uh, East Mebon, another lintel also uh, uh, in, uh, at Mebon Temple. Another Yama, Yama is holding a stick because it is a symbol of uh, justice, of uh, punishment, etc. Facing south. Another view from Prairup, also from the Prairup and Mebon are from the same period, 10th century. Uh, here Yama, which disappears here, Yama is on a buffalo, three-headed buffalo. The lintel faces south. Bhante Sray, yeah, also from the same century. This is a pediment, this is a lintel. Yama is represented uh, on the pediment. This is Yama on his buffalo holding a stick. And on the lintel also holding a stick on a buffalo. Uh, from Monte Samurai. Now we jump up to the 12th century. Yama on his uh, three-headed buffalo with a stick. At Angkor Wat, 12th century, Yama with uh, a multiple arms holding sticks on his buffalo and facing south. All this is totally conformed to, uh, to the um, Indian uh, theory. Yama is the region of the south and of course he is known as the god of the dead, as the judge of the, the dead. This piece comes from uh, Bang Melia. This is Yama on the top. On the bottom, you can see his uh, a number of torturer and of uh, damned soul. You you can uh, see. I don't know if you see it clearly. Uh, the the one of the 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 the, the damned soul is suffering from torture. Another one here. But it is in Angkor Wat that uh, the representation of uh, Yama becomes very spectacular. 
this whole panel in the south part of Angkor Wat, you know the south, uh, is devoted to the scene of uh, hell and the heaven with the, the god Yama in the middle of it. Yama here. You can see here Yama with the uh, many arms holding sticks on his buffalo facing south, etc. With his uh, assessor. You, on the same panel, you know, you can see scene like this. The, these uh, direct uh, torturers are called uh, Kingara in the Sanskrit. In modern Khmer, it becomes Kang Takang. You can see some uh, scene of uh, torture. Here, uh, Kingara. This is for, uh, this is for, uh, you know, bar relief or from sculpture, etc. We have evidence by epigraphy, from epigraphy, uh, from uh, as early as uh, 7th century. For example, this is a Sanskrit inscription mentioning Kinkara. Jacques Edes, the, the, the epigraphist translated by uh, a Yama servant, the Kinkara. The Kinkara you saw, you saw just now, you know. Another inscription from 11th century, bilingual in Khmer and in Sanskrit, uh, mention the, the world of uh, Yama, Yamaloka, etc. So this god was very well known. Kinkara, very, very uh, well known in the ancient Cambodia. It seemed that uh, uh, there was a, not not really a, a swift, but the stress became uh, put on the the second dimension of uh, Yama, the, the Renaissance, the rebirth, the, and the notion of uh, cycle of time. In Angkor, uh, this is Angkor Thom, the, the um, ancient capital of Cambodia, Angkor Thom, and this is uh, in the center of it, the Bajon, this is the royal palace. Uh, which has functioned uh, during at least the five century as a royal palace. And in the northeast corner of it, the northeast side of, uh, uh, with regard to the royal palace, you know the northeast is associated with the rebirth renaissance in Cambodia. The, the, it is very well known uh, so, uh, up to today. Uh, nowadays, the area is called uh, Terrace of Leper King, but this is just a name. The terrace is uh, built uh, with stone and uh, uh, you can see many rows. Of if you look at uh, these rows in detail, you see uh, all along each row, you see a uh, character like this. I, I think they are Kinkara. But uh, if you pay attention, they, they are no more grimacing, but they are uh, rather smiling. Hmm? They hold the uh, stick, etc., but uh, yes. They don't, you know, inspire fear. And according to scholar, the this uh, as you as we see it today, the terrace uh, date back to maybe the end of 13th century, but it may it may have uh, existed before that. And the top of it, this statue was installed. 
This is the statue of Yama in the top. I forgot to say that the uh, scholar thinks that uh, this area, you know, the, the play among maybe a multiple role of uh, this area. One of them was uh, uh, is, uh, the, the, the role of uh, a um, burial ground of uh, cremation, cremation area, cremation ground. No? So this statue is uh, uh, installed atop the, the so-called terrace. It, uh, now, uh, after cleaning, uh, it's his uh, official name inscribed it here is Supreme King of Order. You know the uh, uh, Yama is the judge. Yeah, the, the, the 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 god of the the law the god of the order etc. Uh, judging by the by the script, George said that thing that uh, George said that uh, say that the the the, f the form of the script uh, is from 15th century, but the statue may. Uh, may have existed before. Hmm? Now, coming to modern Cambodia. In modern Cambodia, we have, uh, regarding Yama, we have two kind of representation. We have representation on picture in Buddhist monastery, and another representation is totally symbolic. You cannot see Yama with a body, with a face, but uh, you can only see his altar in ritual. It seems that uh, there are two... Uh, when you go to, you know, uh, in the... Very often in the Buddhist monastery, you can see painting like that, and always located to in the uh, the west. No more the the south now is uh, totally forgotten. The west. Uh, this is a, a modern uh, painting, mural painting. You know, and this is Yama. Huh? Directly uh, uh, in another place. This is Yama. Uh, here he. <laughs> He is acting uh, as a, a direct torturer, but normally uh, you can see uh, things like this: Yama as the king of the the the, the law and order, and uh, they are the, the the direct torturer. Mm? And these people, these uh, souls, are uh, suffering. Uh, here, uh, Yama is here. This is Yama. Uh, all this, the scene. This is uh, uh, quite uh, nothing special, you know. The view like this, you can see in the lot of, uh, quite often in the Buddhist monastery. Sometime in this case, you know, in the east face, you see. Uh, I don't know exactly uh, to what. Uh, uh, sequence of the life of Buddha exactly it relates to but uh, it is the the theme of salvation the east and if you go to the west outside you see the the scene of uh, uh, hell but uh, what is the uh, Buddhist monastery what is Buddhism Yama in this context uh, First of all, I think that uh, it uh, it reminds us of the the fresco of Angkor Wat, but I mean in the level, in the religious level, in the philosophical level, in the of Buddhism, Yama is just uh, here to remind us that uh, uh, our present condition, you know, is the result of our past action in the. Pre our previous life, etc. 
cetera, et cetera. But coming to, you know, uh, immediate concern of people, this dimension, I, I don't mean that is, uh, this dimension is ignored, but uh, tend to be forgotten. Coming to the, the practical, the, the very practical concern, for example, when you organize a, a uh, funeral, when you organize a uh, cremation, for example, the mind of people goes directly to the second dimension of yama, the one who helps you to have a good reincarnation. And uh, in that context, you know, uh, in that level of belief, people think that uh, a good reincarnation is conditioned by uh, a correct, a perfect uh, organ in t ritually speaking, organization of the funeral. If you have a, a master, a, a great master called Acha in Cambodia, uh, who organized a very well known a person who organized that for uh, for the dead, the the dead in question has a chance to uh, have a good reincarnation. Moral uh, moral uh, doesn't uh, matter here. The main thing is to organize properly the funeral. You know, mor moral is uh, almost forgotten in this level. So you have something like two levels. In the moral levels, when you go to a Buddhist monastery, you can see, you know, uh, everything reminds you that this is the result of our bad action in our previous life, etc. But coming to practical uh, concern, this dimension is almost forgotten. And people think about, uh, uh, about uh, a, 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 um, a ritual of cremation properly organized, etc. Uh, if I come back to the royal ancient royal palace of in Angkotom. This is the royal palace. This is the uh, the area of cremation, to simplify, the area of Yama. This is the <coughs> scheme of uh, the, the, the space layout of the royal palace today in Phnom Penh. You can see that uh, this is the north. Huh? So, in the northeast corner, this is the area for cremation. So, uh, pe once more, the northeast is uh, associated with the uh, Renaissance, with a good, good rebirth. With, uh, so, practically, this is this is the 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 the, the people uh, care for. Right? Now, uh, all the example I will show you comes from remote area of uh, Onko, remote places of uh, Onko area, you know. Yama is systematically present, but not under an anthropomorphic representation. Just through his altar that you evoke uh, him. This is a scheme of a, a cremation ground, you know, a cremation field. You always have a uh, enclosure like this from light material, you know. And in the, uh, most of time in the center of it you have the pyre. You can see that in northeast quadrant, you always see this kind of installation. Almost systematically sun mount, 
you know sun mount is uh, made by sand uh, you know height like this uh, normally sun mount is are erected in the new year everywhere it can be in the buddhist monastery it can be in your house especially in the province of Siem Reap. Why? Because new year is a new time, and new time means new space. So you have to build, to rebuild the universe, to rebuild the world. And uh, the presence of St. Mount here is that uh, the idea behind that is rebirth. New year is the rebirth of the world, here is the rebirth of the, the dead person but a good rebirth. Besides, all, all this uh, are linked one to uh, another by a kind of thread, you know, linked to, to this, to the top of this pie. This is a bit theoretical. It, at a maximum, you can see three altar. This one is called Pisnuka. Pisnuka is the uh, patron saint of the of all artisans and uh, especially of architect but the most of time you only see two putakun and yamas altar it is called rian yomariet yeah? yamas altar putakun it is quite difficult to to translate and even to understand, you know, because Potakun is not a not a god, is not a person, is not a Potakun may uh, mean uh, the virtue, Bud Buddhist virtue or virtue of the Buddha. I don't I don't know how to translate it. But the, the most significant, the most important is Yama's altar. It is Yama uh, who is designated like that. When you have only one, uh, the, uh, these are three altars, when you have only two, you can have this. When you have only one, you know, the even the, the Buddha is, uh, how to say, people jumped out the Buddha and uh, only uh, uh, Yama's altar is here systematic yama. You can see the, the importance of the, the three altar. Mm -hmm. This is exam an example from uh, what run this is the enclosure and question etc. This is the pie. In the northeast corner this is Yama altar. You can see that the the, the, the first one Kotokun is most uh, is bigger uh, visually, we we would think that the, it is more the the most important because it is bigger, it is uh, etc. This is Yama. But what happened in the uh, at at that moment? Uh, you know uh, the the coffin. Uh, the, the the cremation uh, is very often collective. Huh? The 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 coffin are uh, burning down and uh, and uh, at the, at the same moment people just uh, prostrate themselves and pray in front of the potakun in front of this in front of this you know in front of this. But uh, when you listen to the prayer. It is Yama. They are addressing Yama in particular for the the, the good reincarnation of the, the dead person. The, these are uh, the, the the new world, uh, the 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 Sun Mount, the new world for for the dead person. This is a cremation among the less sophisticated uh, I happen to see in the Onko area, among the less sophisticated. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, everything has to be here, uh, the enclosure, etc., etc. 
these are two coffin uh, burning in the northeast corner quadrant the, the, there, there was only one altar which is the one of uh, that of Yama no other altar and in this particular case there was uh, even not uh, the sun mound only Yama altar here and you see the the you know talking about uh, the importance of the the proper organization of funeral this man Taku, he died uh, he died in April last April uh, this is not an anecdote I just uh, I'm just telling you because it uh, in the, the 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 this topic, o one time I co had uh, some discussion with him, and I realized that he himself he believed that he is well known by Yama. Incredible! He believed himself. He is not someone who try to boast something. No, not at all. Not at all. But. Uh, in the course of the discussion, I realized that he do believe, he does believe that uh, he is known by Yama in the... <laughs> but uh, now he died. But uh, now he uh, performed the ritual, uh, this ritual, you know, this cremation for uh, villagers. And you know how uh, he, uh, at one moment, he prostrate himself in front of the uh, altar Yama. You know, you, you can see the importance of Yama as the god of the good rebirth. Now, uh, coming for the fortnight of the dead, uh, this is uh, the, the, the most important religious event in Cambodia. A very uh, I would say spectacular, but uh, 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 everything happened, uh, especially in night time. So it is not uh, spectacular for a uh, foreign visitor, for example. But it it's really spectacular in rural area. It it lasts uh, uh, a whole fortnight. Uh, what what uh, what? Uh, uh, is it meant for uh, for night for the death for the dead uh, consists for the, the living to help a category of let's say spirit called Prat Preta in the to be able to is to for us to give a body to these uh, damn soul so that they can reincarnate so we give them a body the but this body is represented by a rice ball a ball of uh, made uh, with uh, uh, sticky rice it is not necessary necessary uh, that uh, the that the the death in question is uh, of your family. It, uh, uh, a any any dead person. Uh, the Preta, of course, was well known in ancient Cambodia. This is a you know a representation of the Preta. We are here in the context of uh, Mahayana Buddhism. The god Lukeshvara is here. They are praying to Keshwara to save them from their condition, you know, from their uh, bad condition in hell. Uh, everything happened in Buddhist monastery. You, you know, uh, the fortnight of the death is rooted in the totally in the Brahmanic Cambodia, not in Hindu Cambodia. We even have inscription from 10th century, etc. But uh, nowadays, Everything happened in the Buddhist monastery. Uh, these are two main buildings eh, for uh, as for ritual. This is the the sanctuary we here. This is the sala. 
and uh, especially during the fortnight people uh, just build a provisional altar called Yama's altar in the northeast corner of the veranda of the Vihir and on the northeast corner of the Sala. But after that they just dismantle it, the, the altar. This is this happened in the Sala, you know, in the northeast corner. N now the south is totally forgotten. Around uh, seven o'clock in the evening, uh, uh, they uh, people pray Yama. Uh, this uh, this uh, prayer addresses directly Yama to help the dead person. This is around seven, let's say seven o'clock. And uh, after that, they gather themselves to, uh, to make a, a, a rice ball from sticky rice. You know, each ball represents a body, a body. This happened around 8 o'clock, always in the Buddhist monastery. And after that, they go to sleep in the Buddhist monastery itself, or if they, uh, or, uh, but they have to come back before dawn to start, starting by, uh, by making this procession. The, 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 all the procession enter the Vihir uh, this way by the east and make three turns circumambulation uh, three times yeah? the three, three times three turns like this and uh, on the way you know uh, they put rice ball here they put rice ball there they throw rice ball away because they say that there are many category of prat of preta. Uh, some can uh, come close to you, some other cannot, etc., etc. But each time they arrive here, you know, they make a halt and uh, and they pray. They pray yama directly Yama. And uh, some put the rice ball in the, on the uh, Yama's altar and in the vicinity. You know the fortnight of that in reality, the the sequence of one of one day is just repeated uh, fourteen times. Mm -hmm. It happened exactly uh, from one night to the other like this. And uh, the fact that uh, they make this uh, procession before dawn is uh, quite uh, significant because. Uh, Dawn is the passage from the obscurity to to light, yeah, from the from the bad condition in hell to uh, to another condition. But now, <laughs> coming to the rice cultivation, nothing to do with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the death. You know, uh, once more, uh, Yama is uh, the, at the origin of time. And time is just a repeated cycle of night and day, night and day, alternating endlessly. Hmm? And the rice cultivation also obey to uh, cycle, the season. The, this is a small ceremony. Uh, I choose the uh, smallest one to, to show you. It concerned the... It happened in May, you know, the 
the opening of the new cycle of rice cultivation because in May the first rain become to uh, fall. You know? uh, this is, uh, it is quite difficult to see, but this is, you know, this enclosure also, it like in cremation, but uh, it has to be done close to a nepta house. What is a nepta? A nepta is a, a uh, spirit uh, considered as the ancestor of the a given uh, rural community. But uh, the nepta, an ancestor, of course, uh, it is always very, very close to, uh, no, to totally associated with agriculture and mainly with rice cultivation. This is why the, the such a uh, ceremony has to be uh, organized close to the nepta. Hmm? You know, the, an enclosure like, like, like uh, in cremation. If you look at the scheme of it, you know, it, it, it can remind you the, the pre what you have seen uh, previously. In the northeast quadrant, you can see Sand Mound and Yamas Alta here. The difference is that there is a Nakta here in the north. We can elaborate the uh, other theory why the Nakta is in the north, but uh, uh, we have not time to. This is the, the, the house of the Nakta. This is the Nakta, you know, he is uh, just represented by a stone. And close to the Nakta you can see rice and husk rice. But this is seed rice, not, not the rice to be consumed, but rice to be, how to say, to be uh, sown. Hmm? Hmm. Yeah, the quantity is symbolic, but uh, uh, the, the meaning is uh, very important. Because it is a new cycle of uh, rice cultivation. You know, the, 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 the idea is that, uh, is that uh, as, as we know, uh, time and space are uh, inseparable. Huh? So, uh, as it is a new time for, for uh, uh, agriculture cycle, I mean uh, to rice cultivation cycle, it has to be a new space also. If you compare the two, this is a cremation area. This is uh, what we uh, just uh, saw. You can see the, 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 the northeast quadrant has not changed. So this, nowadays, the di uh, I, 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 I do not mean that uh, the, the notion of karma, of the, the relation between cause and effect are forgotten. I, I don't mean that. People still know that. Still, know that. But uh, I mean, coming to practical concern, this dimension is more or less forgotten. The most important thing for a funeral is that it has to be done correctly, properly done, etc., with a good uh, officiant, with a famous officiant. The moral, uh, the moral uh, consideration of it has nothing to do here. When, com uh, when, when people come to, to practical concern, it is this dimension of Yama, it is the Northeast. Thank you very much. Okay, well thank you all, thank you all for um, sticking it out in the afternoon, and um, we still have a, a very rich, if, if my speakers will pay attention, we, we, um, we, 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 still, we still have, we're, we're all, we all respect each other, so it's fine to me and Max Makulpa. So, um, so we, we still have a very rich afternoon ahead of us. Um, I've been <coughs> contemplating 
how to how to proceed now. Um, we do have um, some additional visuals that Professor Narayanan will be presenting. So, what I'm thinking of doing is uh, is beginning with uh, Conan and uh, and and Penny, and um, with some comments, and then open it up to our speakers to respond so that they don't get too caught up and far behind. And then we'll move to Basuda's presentation her response and ask them to respond and then open it all up if that's okay with everybody. I, I might okay. just forget what I have to say. You, by you that. might forget. Right. Okay. We, we might all forget. So please, please everybody try to remember um, and remind us. Uh, so let me, let me present to our, our respondents who are, who are equally, um, uh, I don't know, astounding, shall we say, uh, some very, very um, powerful thinkers and um, and uh, making very important contributions to the field. So I, I will begin. Uh, I will begin with Conan Chong, who is a he currently uh, pursuing a master's degree here at SOAS with an Alphawood scholarship. And uh, Conan has uh, come to us from the Asian Civilizations Museum, where he was working as a curator and has taken a break or perhaps a shift in his. Um, we will see in his career to, uh, to really pursue the academic dimension um, of the field. And we are all very, very lucky to have him amongst us. Um, a very powerful, critical, but a remarkably humble uh, voice within, within, the, um, within the department. And um, I'm happy to be able to welcome him here, both with his peers in the audience and uh, with uh, the, the group of scholars who uh, will be responding as well. Um, I could perhaps say a little bit more about the work that Conan is developing at the moment um, in the context of his MA dissertation on some Vaishnavite uh, representations uh, in a few contexts, but you may correct me and tell me where you're heading later, but we'll, we'll leave it at that. So that's some of the work he's, he's been doing. Um, so uh, looking at uh, iconographies in ancient Southeast Asia, we can leave it down, yeah. Uh, Next is Penny Edwards. Uh, Penny is a professor at the uh, Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Penny is perhaps best known in this uh, community for um, a book uh, on the French colonial enterprise in Cambodia, uh, if I'm not mistaken, titled Le Cambodge, something of this order I made. Cambodge, Cambodge. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a subtitle. Anyway, we all know it too well to, um, to stick only to the title. So Penny has um, published that quite a while ago and really made a very important, uh, important uh, shift in our understandings of uh, that moment, and particularly in this context, I think, the moment of perception of Encore and the colonial intervention into, uh, into perceptions of Encore and um, developments of politics in relationship to Encore. That is another form of continuity with the kind of work that we have just heard. Um, Penny has also done significant work and continues to do significant work on the intellectual milieu um, that intersects with, uh, for example, Ochim's work uh, in, the, in the early 20th century. So this is another, another point of um, point of uh, connection, I think, which will be of interest to all of us. And it's developing work also uh, more broadly uh, in Burma at the moment, as I understand it. Uh, uh, so Professor Narayanan here behind me, let me not block her view, uh, is a professor of religious studies at the, unit, at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And um, if I can be a bit provocative, uh, we Southeast Asianists have to learn about South Asia. That's sort of part of our agreement if we work on uh, ancient Southeast Asia in one way or another. Uh, the reverse is not true. South Asianists do not have to look at Southeast Asia. And uh, that is a problem. That's not true. They have to. <laughs> she is one of the people who thinks they have to. They absolutely And Kristen have to. back there is seconding me. But, um, <laughs> but we, I fear, are in the minority. Uh, with this view, and uh, we are, so therefore, we Southeast Asianists <laughs> are very, very privileged to have an expert South Asian voice uh, really turning very, very intently to think about um, Cambodian religion, Cambodian iconographies, and bringing that knowledge. Um, well, in fact, what I heard uh, Professor Narayanan say at 
lunch today is that she has to uh, forget everything she knows about South Asia in order to uh, learn about Southeast Asia. And that's an interesting perspective coming from a South Asianist. So uh, that's where we are. Uh, that's who we are. And let me now invite, what we will do is invite, yes, I think I've already gone through this. So let me invite uh, Conan to, to uh, give his comments. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you, Dr. Ami and uh, Dr. Miguel, for your very thought-provoking uh, presentations. Um, and I guess in my response, sorry, can you hear me at the back? Can I speak a bit louder? Okay. Uh, so in my response, I'd just like to draw a few themes which I think uh, run through both your presentations and which I think uh, engage directly with uh, the goals of this workshop. Uh, the first being um, the idea of a continuum, this continuum that connects um, well, I guess in this case, um, Angkor as a linchpin of uh, uh, culture to, to the present day. Um, and so, uh, to quote again from the, from the workshop um, description, uh, we're kind of concerned with how art uh, sustains cultural dynamics, so which I interpret, I, which I interpret as how um, image making, the, how the creation of certain types of images uh, serve as points of cohesion for this ever-evolving um, uh, cultural formation of the is Cambodia or, or, you know, or Khmer culture uh, in, a, in a diachronic or long-term perspective. Uh, and this cultural formation can include um, you know, ritual practice, can include uh, structures of knowledge, uh, can include iconography and, and so on. Um, and so I just want to, you know, uh, in, in the context of, of a continuum, uh, I find, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the art, art history we're talking about images. Uh, and I think, you know, to me, um, images interact very interestingly uh, <coughs> in, in, the, in this continuum, in, in this continuum, because um, the, the image itself is a very dynamic uh, thing in, in, in time. Uh, it occupies, you know, it, it, it is present to us uh, when, we, when we approach it in the physical context, but it's, it exists in multiple times uh, in its history. Um, and I think, uh, well, one thing I wanted to draw out was, uh, uh, Dr. Ang, I, I, I realized you, um, you you put up the photo of the um, uh, of the Yama that is now in the, the National Museum of Cambodia, which um, I've read in, in uh, also um, is, is taken as a figure of the leper king. Uh, and it, it, it also uh, currently receives a lot of um, um, worship from, from uh, regular visitors, from Cambodians, uh, even you know, after it was moved from um, uh, where it was found in Angkor Thom to, to the National Museum of Cambodia. So I mean, for me, that's like a very good example of how images occupy different moments of time. I mean, and as you said also, that um, the inscription that identifies it as the Alma, it's, it's, it's later, right, it's 15th century. So obviously, somebody in the 15th century would have taken that piece and, and you know we can say we identified or revalued it as as uh, as Yama, and and started this um, uh, cult of worshiping the image that continued till uh, continues till today. Um, so I just wonder if you could um, talk a little bit more about how such objects uh, work or, or, or you know, what they say about the nature of this continuum of, of human culture. Um, and um, in, in the same in the same um, along the same lines. Uh, um, I, I wanted to, to bring up, um, you know, in talking about the, the cult of the Devaraja, you're actually addressing this sort of quite age-old question, right? Like, what is the nature of, what is the, the Devaraja? Is it, um, um, uh, it, you know, is it uh, an object? Is it a ritual? Is it is it a material or immaterial process? And um, it seems like you identified the birth of this uh, cult with the uh, figural representation of uh, uh, Shiva Nataraja. Um, and, and I think that's one of the, um, the sort of more, the, one of the bolder of your propositions that it's the, the Shiva Nataraja figural uh, anthropomorphic um, uh, sculpture that represents the Devaraja cult as opposed to um, the aniconic cult of the Shiva Linga, which is more associated with the Temple Mountains of, of Cambodia. Um, so I was wondering if you could um, uh, speak a bit more about uh, about that. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, also.
also so there's one thing. Uh, <coughs> and the next thing uh, I wanted to, to talk about a bit more was um, the idea of the civilizing process that, that you mentioned uh, following um, uh, so. Yeah, yeah, for, for me, yes. Because uh, I guess you don't, you didn't really go into detail with, in, in your presentation uh, that much about it. But um, by invoking this uh, Elias's uh, ideas of civilizing, um, it's not a teleological process that you're, you're saying by any means. But it's more like a, a Freudian kind of <coughs> super, a super ego, right? Like it's the civilizing process is more the internalization of. Um, cultural attitudes, and I, for me, like that's why that's how it, you know, the, from the top <coughs> of the bottom, uh, the hierarchy gets gets um, uh, uh, fleshed out through through this cult. Um, so, in a way, the defining feature of um, the Devaraja cult is the creation of these hierarchies in society, right? Um, so, in, I don't know. In a way, that's how the that's how the cult survives. Um, through through maintaining these uh, social hierarchies, and I wonder if you could talk a bit more about how that's maintained um, in, in the middle in the, the post uh, and um, and um, I don't know a little on these organized notes. Uh, yes, and uh, I, 
I didn't say that the, the, the because I have no idea, but uh, I tend to think that the, the statue did exist before the inscription. If you look at the, 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 the inscription, it is very roughly written. No, I like, like both of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that uh, the, 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 the inscription and the uh, and statue itself uh, mm -hmm. may like to the same period. I, I, I do think that the people take back uh, earlier than, than, than the 10th uh, than the 15th century. No, I, I mean that everything is ambiguous yeah. or ambivalent. Maybe, maybe this, uh, this, this is more proper, ambivalent. Because uh, yama is the, you know, alternation of day and night uh, cycle, repeated cycle, etc. The second point was on the end. Uh, because from ancient Cambodia, we, uh, what we have is as evidence is, is on the epigraphy and uh, and the uh, sculpture and monument. Huh? Epigraphy show us that uh, Cambodian mm, knew uh, from the earliest time uh, the, the, uh, who is the, who was Yama etc. Because uh, as I show an excerpt, it was an inscription from uh, the seventh century. But if you look at that, they, they are very few, maybe three of them only in future. But uh, it is, you, you read something menacing you, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it makes you, uh, it, because it is uh, a kind of uh, warning uh, about that action, etc. We are on the theoretical level. Beside the very few inscription. What we have is sculpture, and mainly a sculpture in the monument, in the pediment or in the temple. Is this a coincidence or is this, I, I don't know, but uh, I, uh, I uh, see that uh, the main thing we have from that time are from the 10th century. And a bit, uh, from the 10th century, everything seemed to be uh, uh, in total, uh, you know, respect to the Indian tradition. Yama holding a stick, uh, facing the south direction. And uh, from the 12th century, that uh, Yama, uh, Yama is uh, shown with uh, more, uh, you know, concrete action. But uh, we should not forget that we are in monument. Yeah? You, you see the, the sculpture in Angkor Wat in, in, the, in the monument, in Angkor Wat. All that, for me, is you know, to be put on a moral or religious eschatologic level of the belief. Only from uh, at the earliest, uh, the end of uh, um, 13th century, that uh, we can see uh, <coughs> the so-called uh, Terrace of the King, you know, located in the northeast of the, the royal palace, uh, the, the ground for cremation. Mm -hmm. This is all the uh, evidence we have. I don't know, uh, we, we cannot have, we, we can uh, guess, we can have some idea of what could be uh, the, the ritual at that time, etc. But uh, uh, we have no proof. But uh, we can clearly see that at least it was no more question of the South, because in the uh, uh, according to uh, Indian uh, belief, when we die, we have to have a long journey 
to read the 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 realm of uh, Yama. It takes uh, more or less one year, I think, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et but uh, a ground, a cremation ground. What what is a cremation ground? It is a you know it responds to a practical concern to a. Uh, this is you. You believe or you do not believe, but you have to do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, this dimension of yama uh, up here, maybe be because all the view I show uh, on the ritual, you know, happen. What happened in the ritual in the in the villages? It made me think about the Vedism, you know. Uh, we do not have a monument, a permanent building, etc. But the most of things are just made for the time, the duration of the ritual. Concerning rice cultivation, concerning funeral, concerning other rites of passing. And then the, 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 uh, in the Vedism, you know, you have to, you, you have to, how to say, to gather all the conditions so that God can be present in the in the moment of the ritual. You, you are the the you provoke the, the presence of God. Maybe uh, in ancient Cambodia, uh, this was the general. Uh, practice, but we, we have no proof. We can have only one proof that the, the terrace of the left team. But uh, uh, in Cambodia today, especially in Mongolia, we are, uh, I know the best. Uh, I, I, I do not pretend that I know everything in Cambodia, but I mean I work a lot in that zone, that area. I can see, it, it made me think about the, 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 the idea in Vedism. The present of this is why I talk about enclosure. You know, you have to, you have to transform an area to be not not a profane area, but uh, you know, with the northeast, with the, uh, you you build a cosmos, you build a, a new universe, and after that, uh, after the moment of the ritual, everything is desacralized. Did it happen like this in ancient Cambodia? We have no proof, but I tend to think that uh, I think that my idea can be a bit like this. Yama as the god of justice. This dimension has never <coughs> been forgot forgotten. Because even the minister of justice up to up to the the, the decade 1950, mm -hmm. the minister of justice was called of Nya Yomriet. Yomriet means uh, Yamaraja. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. yeah. This dimension was not is not forgotten, but there are two levels. In the pure a pure level of uh, belief, this is Yama. In the level of, uh, you know, you have to do something to the dead person to be, to, to reincarnate in a good position. This is Yama Northeast, and no more Yama West or no more South. Different forms of Yama. Yeah. Yeah. But sort of, I mean, in, uh, I don't know if it's complementary or it's in, in opposition to what you're talking about with the Vedic rituals. Can also reference your earlier work on the Nyekta, um, which is like these, the earth spirits, right, that, that you said uh, there's a hunt mm -hmm. you know, on the north you know, of, the, of the agricultural rituals. Um, do, uh, because in, in the, with, uh, I remember in your earlier publication in the Nick class, mm -hmm. you, you write, you sort of, mm -hmm. the, the pictures of, um, ru of, you know, ruined stupas or, or like rocks and, you know, basically an iconic objects that are sort of made. The is directly associated with agriculture and mainly with the rice cultivation. But the presence of Yama in the, the opening uh, cycle of the, 
Yama is not in that uh, context, not really a god, not really a, a genius, not the Yama is there to 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 remind us about cycle. And this is a new cycle, so you have to start in a proper way. You have to rebuild the universe, you have to build the, the sun mound. You know, you 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 uh, you build a the the dimension of the yama for that ceremony is not it's not uh, that of Nata. Mm. Nata is really a culture, but yama in that uh, context is how to say you you provoke the child to have the normal cycle a normal uh, regime of Mansur. Mm -hmm. I think. But he's outside the cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, the cycle for, for rice cultivation. Mm -hmm. Greg, do you want to chime in? Uh, so the question was about Nambaria. Yes, it's a tough question. Yeah, that's what I think. Uh, so to clarify this point, as you know, Norbert Elias was hardly criticized by historians, especially by pre-modern historians. Um, he wasn't a historian, he was a sociologist. Uh, so the use we made here of Norbert Elias is a use uh, invoked by Roger Chartier, who is a modernist, a pre-modern specialist in France. And um, according to him, there's three virtues of Norbert Elias. Uh, first, it's a long time property. Uh, second, as you said, is a model of uh, diffusion of the high culture to the bottom of the society, which is quite useful. And uh, for us, the main point is that what is described, what he is describing, is the life of a structure. So, responding to the first question about what is the Raja, it's not an object, it's not an idea, it's not uh, a right. It's all this diving together that is according to us and what we are researching is a structure. The Raja for us is a structure. Mm -hmm. So that's why when we change, you change an element, uh, an element is uh, replaced by another one mm -hmm. because the time is going on, uh, the structure is still maintained, but then the sense, the global sense of the, of the structure has changed. So that's. But can I can I just come back to Conan's um, point, which was this other question that you're now getting to address? Is that um, that I mean you were interested in getting Greg to speak more about the way that you are nonetheless positing the birth of the cult in the figure in a very concrete figure of the Nataraja, right? So I, and I also had some questions from members of the audience during the break about that. What are the could you it was an effect of your presentation as well, um, where you didn't have time to go through the evidencing of that identification. So I don't know if you can speak to that rather bold um, statement. So you're looking at a structure, but you are associating your birth with a specific object. Um, so so uh, what, what we think that the the Sadashiva is the, the, her the hurt of the structure uh, because uh, this is associated to the uh, dead rebirth, the destruction of the world and the reconstruction of the world. Uh, so, and it is a feature that we see all around the history of Cambodia associated with king, death rebirth, and how the king is the one who is the intermediate be between uh, the common people and this process of death rebirth. Uh, that's the main uh, reason. I don't know if I answer the question, but... Uh, I mean, so in a way, it's kind of connected to the, 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 what Yama produced, the structure of the cycle that Dr. An was talking about. I mean, this death rebirth was very much connected with... Uh, for example, Yama, for us, is a typical example of diffusion from the top to the bottom of the society. Uh, because at the, at the beginning of the process, the meeting with Yama is reserved to the king, mm -hmm. or maybe a very teeny elite. At the end of the process, every Cambodian is going to meet Yama. Uh, and that's a process we are going to like. Uh, and 
what we saw also is that uh, Professor Anjulian just uh, uh, mentioned it in his presentation. Uh, the figure of Yama is moving. Uh, we have a clear different Yama mm -hmm. between the beginning and the end. At the end, the, 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 the appearance of Yama is not the same. So mm -hmm. it tells us also something. Uh, it's like the, it looks like there is two Yama, uh, smiling Yama, new smiling Yama, or the terrifying Yama from the old ancient mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So if, if I may add something, Yama once more is close to human being. Mm -hmm much closer than uh, any other god. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I, the Professor Malamu said something about Yama. He said that only Yama can be king. Uh, I just uh, said just now that uh, the Minister of Justice was called Konya Yomariye. It means Yama Raja, you know? You have the word Raja king. Mm -hmm. No other god. Uh, I, I never come across uh, uh, any uh, title like that for other God. He is, for human being, he is God, but he is king. He, he is close to us. So close to human beings. Can you want to?
um, or perhaps uh, francophone wording when you said it was a scientific, uh, no, it was scientific. Um, he said he was defending scientific knowledge, taking it back from the French and reasserting sovereignty. And I, I, I think that maybe you meant intellectual sovereignty because he's taken back what's been taken from him in a way. Um, but also, I don't sense that it was necessarily strictly scientific, and that's not to refute his um, very clear, uh, brilliantly argued, no doubt, thesis. Uh, but there was something else in there, which is the spirituality, it is the potency, it's precisely that which cannot necessarily be traced through the documents that has survived. And that spirituality um, lends a sovereignty that cannot be violated by um, the colonial scholarship, in a sense. It's beyond that, uh, and that's referring to Papa Chatterjee's um, scholarship uh, on what resides in the inner spiritual space and cannot be really... Um, violated. So to, to, to go on to uh, Shiva, um, your paper argued that what is at stake is the sacralization of the person of the king, and if the king is protected, he can act with godlike power. So my response was, and I've been doing a lot of study and teaching about kings and kingship uh, in Burma uh, and Cambodia and elsewhere, it's my new project, is looking at a rebel prince and a king, uh, and a lot of symbolism and so forth. So yes, uh, Shiva, he has, he offers a protection of the king, and we often talk about the Deva Raja as somebody who's absolutely all powerful. But actually reading your paper, I thought, well, actually he's also accountable because this relationship in a way makes the king accountable to the gods, if not to men on earth. So the king, the Deva Raja, he's no longer accountable to those people below him. And in a way it gives him something, it gives the system rather some sort of divine checks and balances on kingly behavior. Uh, on the continuity, uh, so you argue for this spectrum of continuity from around the previous to the 10th century, you trace it back to the 9th century to the present. You look at localization and adaptation, and you say that Shiva was already there long before the foundation of the Devaraja cult. So again, my question would be what then triggered, what really triggered the foundation of the cult? Were there external factors? Were there political factors? Uh, and alongside the spiritual factors, for example, in the Sadokok Tom inscription, you know, Java is referenced, and then there's a presence of the wise man or the, the um, Brahman. And since this is not my area, I can make outlandish speculations, so my stakes are low, so bear with me. Um, but then I was thinking as I was reading your paper, in a way, is the Shiva cult adopted and adapted in a way for military protection? And I will go on to try and make some sense of that. Your thesis is that first the Devaraja cult survives until today in Phnom Penh palace ritual, and that the foundation happens alongside a process of reinforcing the earth um, when the king begins to be called Lord of here below the surface, or Patei Kraum, so surface below, and this gives a new focus on human activity. So this ritual incorporation of the kingdom um, becomes a ritual incorporation and even partially a domestication of the divine of Shiva. Um, I'm going to refer to the stop, uh, sorry, stop, Tom, uh, inscription and the Phnom Kulen, which I think will be uh, well known to everyone with this uh, right that supposedly established that not only the Devaraja, but the Khmer Empire on the Phnom Kulen. And I wondered whether this, this, this process of the Devaraja, and we think of it as um, the emperor at the top of the mountain, and then there's the Brahmin who's the go-between uh, with the divine. Um, <coughs> is there also a process of, of diffusion or suffusion of that power and aura working downwards? And you've used a top-down model, and I'm thinking of mountains, the land, of the Panum uh, housing Naga spirits, and are they already there, these spirits? So does it work up and down uh, and generate other territorial spirits? And I'll get on to say a bit more about that. In other words, a sort of tutelary cults that are radiating outwards, not just up down. Um, your paper studies step by step how the evolution of the cult extended from the royal palace, and, and you do use the vocabulary of extension and expansion. Um, 
But with the examples that you showed, I felt, and it was for the purpose of your paper, it was sort of, you know, um, in this century this happened, and then that happened. And so we go from um, uh, Angkor and the beautiful examples you gave uh, to Udong. So as many of you will know, um, the after the, the sacking or um, whatever conquest or emptying of Angkor, and it was never completely emptied by Siam, uh, in the um, early 15th century, supposedly between the 13th and 15th century, um, the regalia, including the plate and the sword that you showed, uh, and bronzes were dispersed. And that regalia, the plate can and others were taken with the royals, but ours, like the bronzes, uh, they were taken to Siam, they were taken up to Mandalay, and anyone who visits them in the Mahamuni Pagoda can be so aware of their potency monks and others are coming up to these statues, these bronzes taken from Angkor, and they radiate power. So I was wondering, with this dispersal of the potent objects, uh, does that diminish the power of the Deva Raja, or does it in a way expand his um, cult of power? Um, and then I'll skip uh, a little bit to um, with your, um, you showed very clearly how Shiva is moved out. So you looked at the Pimeneh cat inscription, excuse me, and the Dreibom, the three worlds. You looked at the 11th century Stockholm Tom inscription. And you looked at the 12th, 13th century um, Bayan and Buddhism, how Shiva is moved out close to the fringes. And the Linga of Shiva is replaced in the central position by a Buddhist transcendental deity. So. You, make, you argue very clearly that Shiva is put aside from the sanctuary and from the sovereignty. Um, so here are my two outlandish theories. Um, so it is a possible theory that Shiva is moved out, but he is still essential because he is the protector of the kingdom and its sovereignty, and he has to be moved out of it to protect it, both in spiritual and spatial terms. Um, because, or and B, because Buddhism is precisely against violence uh, and the military. So his role is almost as important, or at least it continues to be essential, if not spiritually and spatially central. Um, and then just a couple of comments where you were, uh, so where you did reference the weapons in the bronze pavilion uh, in, the, in the palace now, um, it was, I, I, you reference them as weapons, and I was wondering, well, are they really weapons, or are they regalia? Uh, because scholars have suggested that these actually do hold the Deva Raja, um, that they hold that potency. Um, and then, in relation to uh, Mesa, or the White Lady, recalling Uma Durga, And this uh, relates, um, in a way, to Conan's comments, and I'm sure it's something you, you've been thinking through very carefully. Um, but I just wondered if you were perhaps transposing or projecting Durga onto something that is feasibly entirely local, or more local than your, lo your analogy suggests. Uh, because women have many powers uh, in spirit law in many cultures. They're often associated with the earth, they're of the earth. Um, and so, yeah, there are the grandmother goddesses, uh, there's Ye Kmao, as that Pai Lin, but is this necessarily black Kali? Um, because um, black um, and blackness and ideas about it, a uh, light woman exist in all cultures. So I wondered, were you suggesting a fusion or an amalgamation uh, of uh, Uma Durga? Uh, it, it wasn't clear, or something less or more. And I was wondering alongside that about the incorporation uh, of um, Ye Mao and others um, around Cambodia. And Fabian Lucho has done work on this, and I've done some work with uh, Krishna. Uh, in fact, we did a couple of field trips to Pai Lun, something I've been working with alongside the Burmese community. Uh, is Ye Yat and Phnom Yat and these uh, tutelary spirits who are at Pai Lin. Ye Yat is there, um, Mei Sa is there, uh, Ye Beb and so forth. Um, but Ye Yat is somebody who's very much a creation and a fusion uh, of the Burmese presence and Khmer beliefs, so indicating uh, adaptation. Um, and finally, on the externalization of the figure of Shiva, um, 
I, I, I had a comment or suggestion or maybe a question. So he's on the periphery and he's on the sidelines. He's no longer at the center, but he is on the borders. So he's actually expanded his zone of protection in a way. As the Khmer Empire has shrunk, Siva's boundaries, uh, albeit in Angkor, or the royal palace have expanded. So I'm repeating myself in this bit, but is this incorporation of Shiva to the periphery, whereby he's pushed outside, but at the same time his domain expands, the way of incorporating violence and giving it divine, sac divine sanction uh, since the adoption of Buddhism as a moral order, um, and so lending a spiritual legitimacy to the idea of violence as well as lending actual protection. And finally, I just wanted to say that it's a really fantastic scholarship and argument. Uh, and thank you very much, and uh, it was really, really inspired me, as you can see, we have a lot of uh, round of applause. So uh, I have a, just a very few questions uh, for uh, Michel Lien, uh, which are also put out of my um, ignorance, and I learned so much from your paper. The so one question was on the Kinkara, the, the Kinkara, I'm probably pronouncing it terribly. Um, so Yama's sort of torturers. Uh, in one of the final slides you showed of the painting in a Buddhist monastery and their representation, I noticed that there were torturers with ox heads, and I wondered if they were associated with Yama because he rides on an ox. It's a torturers, and the Kinkara often have cow or ox heads. That was one question. A second question uh, was, uh, it was with the offerings to Yama that you showed and you talked about the offerings, um, I couldn't see, it looked like they were just offering one incense stick. I wondered how many incense or if there's particular type of offerings to Yama, uh, because for Buddhist offerings, you know, often obviously it's the three to represent three jewels. And finally, on Apnya Yamalek in the 1950s, uh, as the, you know, the Minister of Justice, um, and this relates a bit to some of the things I was saying about the spread of the Nyak Da and these other titillary spirits uh, across Cambodia. Um, when the international, whatever it is, tribunal for the trial of international, I forget the acronym, um, but for the trial of crimes against humanity by the Khmer Rouge, when that was established and a great new building was funded, uh, the statue outside it, I believe, was of and the Akbar of Dabba Bombay with his big iron stick. Uh, and when one goes before a Cambodian court, as I understand it still, um, the person who is, one is asked to swear that they won't lie to, or whatever, swear an oath to, uh, is to Dabba uh, Bombay or Bumi Akbar, or perhaps if it's to Yama Yamani. I just wanted to know some of my questions inspired by the tour, and then more specific with my comments. <coughs> you know, starting with the uh, Nyata, mm -hmm. the uh, anthropomorphic representation of Nyata, I think it is uh, relatively uh, recent, mm -hmm. uh, a relatively recent phenomenon, because nowadays you see man is there, everything can be made, uh, <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. traditionally including the famous Nyata, the most famous of Cambodia, of Bosa, traditionally it was only a, a stone. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, for uh, maybe 30 years or at least 20 years now, uh, you, the, the new, not, not uh, the new representation <coughs> of the Nata are more or less systematically uh, anthropomorphic. Mm -hmm. This is for the, the Nata, the, the ancestor of the uh, village community but uh, it could it could uh, happen this a, a kind of contagion uh, from the young uh, effectively to uh, because Nata uh, of course uh, the, the, the first uh, function of Nata is to uh, regulate the, the regime of monsoon etc for the, for the crop but uh, his second uh, say function is to punish <laughs> bad people, I mean, uh, among heads. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe this, uh, there, there has been some kind of contagion from the young rate, effectively, uh, now, uh, when the uh, is represented, 
két állítanyagokat, ami ezt volt, de ennek a komoknak még a rökönyökkel is van. A he holds a stick, a big uh, symbol of punishment, and uh, he always has a, a, a great messing face, etc. I, I have no, uh, I, I have no uh, answer to give you for that. Just that uh, it can, it can be a kind of a statement with, uh, you know, the the the, the netta, uh, punishing bad people. This is not the, the, the basic dimension of the, the basic you know, nature of uh, the Nata. But uh, yeah, like uh, you mentioned Ye Mai, you know? Mm -hmm. The Ye Mai of the real concerned people, <laughs> which mean the, the fishermen, fishing family living in the a really coastal area of Cambodia mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the Yemal, mm -hmm. uh, a new phenomenon, very new phenomenon. Uh, this is a, a very fascinating uh, topic, you know, because, uh, how do you say, uh, politician, the people who have some uh, up high administrative position in provinces, businessmen, etc., all that, and the, 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 the need of uh, the expansion of tourism in Cambodia, now, uh, now there is a real, uh, a new belief in Yemen, but nothing to do with the traditional uh, Yemen of the, the, the fishermen. But this work, uh, I think this is a very fascinating uh, subject for, for research for that. But uh, I, I know that I, I, I have not uh, answered your question. No, you've given me more uh, things to think about. Thank you very much. So the first question was uh, about Ho Chi Minh. Oh yeah, and yeah. If I, I and that there was a question that was uh, yeah, that was uh, the parallel I made between uh, the, the writing of Ho Chi Minh in, in, uh, in law and the writing of Ho Chi Minh in 1948. Mm. Uh, so. Uh, and you, you were saying that it was a little bit artificial or something like that. I don't know, I just really, because you said scientific knowledge and I wondered if you meant sort of intellectual or actually like... So the, 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 the common uh, way he's, uh, he's, he's working on it is that in his dissertation in 1941 and in uh, the communication of the Société Asiatique in 1948, he always used the way Cambodian say things to mm -hmm. argue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, the beginning of the dissertation in 1941 is uh, writing down the paper for the first time, I guess, the word that was uh, widespread among Cambodians, but always in secret, <coughs> when she never hears that, mm -hmm. that was uh, the way the Cambodian uh, designates the French at that time, mm -hmm. which was Asura, demons. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They went to the palace and they, they put a gun on the head of the Rodom and yeah. so on and so on. So after that, they say, all people say, Asura mm. like that, make a home. Mm. So the demon with the, the, the arms uh, of iron, iron arms and uh, the red eyes. So that's the beginning of this, uh, mm. of the, of the thesis. Uh, and all, uh, all the arguments are. Uh, uh, are going further mm -hmm. uh, from this basis. And when he argues against the death, what does he say? He says, the god Dari can be God King. Why? Because in modern Cambodian, mm -hmm. Da means off. Mm -hmm. It's kind of genitive. Mm -hmm. So he still uses the vernacular way mm -hmm. to say things, 
to argue mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. French mm -hmm. That was uh, the, the, that's why I was, I was trying to link the two yeah. mm -hmm. the two words. Uh, so the second question. Uh, yeah. Can I just come back to this question? Because I think there may be a um, stop me if I'm wrong, honey, but I think there may be a kind of miscommunication, which is linguistic, going on here. Is that so? The French term scientifique. You can use it in English, but what it really means in English, and I'm sorry, I should have, I, I forget about it. Yeah, it means it means intellectual, right? So a sort of, and I think what Penny is saying, and here's where I think the linguistic breakdown might be happening, <laughs> is that Penny is saying that, okay, so he's using, Ocean is, he's making an intellectual argument about sovereignty, right? And so he's, his tool is the Khmer language and Khmer expression. And if you say this in Khmer, then sovereignty has to be thought of, the relationship between the god and the king through this Khmer expression has to be thought of in this way, um, which, is, which is one interpretation of Devaraja in Sanskrit and which differs from Seda's interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what Penny is saying is that what he's using is not only the Khmer language in an intellectual slash scientific manner in order to make that argument, but he's saying for sovereignty, for Khmer sovereignty, that he's ultimately saying that there's something, that his claim to sovereignty, his claim to maintaining, or his bid to maintain Khmer sovereignty in this intellectual argument, goes beyond the intellectual. It goes beyond the scientific proof of language. If that's, that's, that's what, what I, I was... That's what you're... Yeah. That's and what I that's was. where there's a spiritual realm of something which, is, which can't be violated. Um, they can't be named through scientific proof. And that that's ultimately what he's about. Um, does that make sense? Or also, I mean, I'm suggesting it's also. Okay. I mean, Oshian is a remarkable figure, and he's a remarkable figure for his intellectual power, but it's an intellectual power which exceeds the pure scientific proof that he's making. Um, that's kind of the point, I think. And then the other point was that it's this sort of cultural sovereignty or spiritual sovereignty. And one thing the French were really terrible at was training lawyers. They were also terrible at training uh, in the French period, Cambodian, actual Cambodian archaeologists. Um, so in that period, Ching and his frustration that you talk about, um, you know, there were Cambodians lobbying to become lawyers, but the French wouldn't let them as if they weren't quite ready for it. And I wondered if that's because the French had this kind of romanticized, nostalgic idea about these Cambodian mores and customs, and you're not quite ready yet to handle Western law. And that, to me, that was what I was getting at about the sovereignty. Mm. Um, yeah. Thank you. What was the chronology of this uh, from Biden by the French to? Well, that was in my longer notes that I will share with you. I mean, before Oshien, before... Yeah, it was before Oshien, and that's what Sally Lowe has. And they've been pushing that, and Cambodians were asking the French to establish lawyers and barristers, and so, yeah, and the French were, no. It's, it's pretty interesting. So it really struck me as an example, as somebody who's actually probably have to prove himself outside of the law because he's really not allowed to prove himself inside of the law. So he's kind of an out <laughs> 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 But you don't have to respond to all the comments, <laughs> Gregory, if so, you don't feel like it. We can uh, discuss later. There was another question about the uh, the origin of the creation, why it, uh, it appears. Oh yeah, like what kind of triggered all of this? You're saying that it's been around for like a long, long time. It's so just the main hypothesis, what do you think the it's a very general yeah. hypothesis, is that uh, at that time in societies, mm -hmm. you change state. So mm -hmm. if you change scale, right, right. You, you can't uh, govern, uh, I mean, 100 peoples as you govern a more, mm -hmm. more populated uh, population. So mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, about the missile. About the missile, the general hypothesis has always been that uh, the Ktonian coast mm -hmm. uh, we're here from the beginning of the Indianization. Mm -hmm. It is the main yeah. thesis. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, maybe in contrary to this doxa, we assume 
but in the continuity of Ho Ching's work and Dr. Ho Ching's work and Dr. Hong Chiu-Ying's work, that the Indianization is uh, more deeper than we previously thought. Mm. So typically with Mesa, we think that it is a later reconfiguration of the, of the goddess. Uh, and I didn't show the uh, lower part of the, bar of the Bayon bar relief, but on the lower part, you see what we assume is the sacrifice uh, the Dogra sacrifice with the buffalo. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in the 17th century, mm -hmm. when you read the legal text, what you see, there's no netta, mm -hmm. there's just mesa. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. 50 or 60 mesa all around the country, uh, white lady, and the mesa of mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, the one is in yeah. the center as the capital. and. They say that they uh, bring buffaloes to sacrifice it. So uh, I don't think it's a, it's a kind of a local cure that has uh, okay. been here for, for, for a long, long, long time. I think it's, it's something new mm -hmm. based on yeah. mm -hmm. all things. Mm -hmm. You want to stop there? Okay. All right. So, uh, Russell, I can I can be your clicker here. No, I. I like. I'm a control freak. Oh, you're. Thank you very much, Ashley, for inviting me. And thanks to our wonderful presenters. It's a particular privilege uh, to be talking in front of Lokru, um, Julian, today. Thank you very much uh, for all that you've taught us over the years. And many thanks for all your scholarship. A special thanks to all of you for being here on a wonderful afternoon. Um, fully worth it for all of us, um, but to stay this late. Thank you. Um, my talk, my comments today will be a series of suggestions, uplifting certain points, questions. The comments will be more in line of suggestions or looking at, at possibilities, um, the whole universe of meanings. Um, and I was wondering if we could look at latitude here of concurrent ideas. Uh, like any good Indian, I don't like the word or, I like and. We like to have this and that and that, all those multiple meanings for any given story. So there wouldn't be any one single meaning, for instance, for the churning of the ocean of milk. I think we can come up with eight or 10. And so this is simply to add to the uh, pot and stir. Um, in a larger way, it kind of goes back to the question that Ashley raised in the beginning, the connections between South and Southeast Asia. Um, and I, just to be provocative here, would say that one needs to study Southeast Asia just as one needs to study Trinidad or any other form, not in terms of inclusive Hinduism, not colonize other places intellectually, but to, it's as inherent and in, as important in understanding the Hindu tradition as it would be in trying to understand Tamil versions of Hinduism, Assamese versions, and they're all very different. They all have the local traditions. And they only accepted those parts of the Sanskritic stuff which was inherent there already, as you have argued, in Cambodia, what meets the needs and what is part of the tradition and which they can go for. Cremation is one of them, as uh, Loku has, um, as you have argued. Um, other ideas like the linga in the earlier papers. So I'll be adding to some of these, and it looks today like I keep going back to the Sanskrit or the Indian stuff, but I'm asking what if we were to take those into consideration? How would these look different? For instance, Angkor. Yes, 
it's it's three story facing west and there's only one other temple I know like that in the world um, in Kanchipuram 8th century west facing three floors and so on and having a similar program of sculptures but Angkor is nothing like that it's on steroids and it's like um, part of it is like Oriya temples and so on. So each one has its own vocabulary. Um, first part of it will be to Greg's paper. Um, and you have argued that this concept is not earlier than the 10th century. I would like to say, yes, the words may not be earlier, but the ideas are already there in place, uh, fueling. So let's think briefly here about Preco. And it was built late 9th century, dedicated to the ancestors between Dravarman, Jayavarman II, and Rudravarman. So what's this got to do with anything? It comes back to the question of what kind of temples were these? And I'd like to evoke Padma Kaimal's work here a little bit briefly. What, or what kinds of kingships can we think of when we think of Indian kingships? When we're not thinking of it in a divine way, there are at least two kinds. One is the warrior kingship and the other is the in incorporative, integrative kind of kingship. The warrior kingship is when a king uh, directly appeals to his ancestors um, to legitimate himself. So sure, I'm from this great Vamsha, I'm from this great lineage of people. Um, it, they conquer the earth, the moon, and the stars, and you know, they did everything, everything else. He, he puts himself in that warrior lineage. And the I intriguing part, of course, is in Cambodia, they also put themselves in the matrilineal side in, uh, frequently. And this puts them, legitimates their position as a king. So sovereignty is, however, ref and confined to the royal family. And one could argue that. We'll come back to the Devaraja concept, but the Preko would involve this kind of hearkening of the, the ancestor model. Whereas some of the other temples fall into what um, Nicholas Dirks, Burton Stein, and others have called the incorporative kingship. And the incorporative kingship involves when a king b uh, buys himself all his vassals, his, all his people, underlings, by giving favors, giving gifts to them, and making them part of a larger corpus of kingship. And where we would go with this is that when the Deva Rajya, Rajya, the kingdom part comes, it doesn't stop with the chieftains with whom the king is linking himself, but the idea of moves on perhaps to all parts, all stretches of the community. Nevertheless, we do have ideas of the warrior and the incorporative kingship combining here with the Devaraja concept. It's all it's not all I am God business. It is very practical. So we go back when you go back to Preko, we have the uh, questions. When we call someone Prithvindishwara, Prithvindra Indreshwara, the Lord of Prithvindra. Is this simply a memorial temple? Or even a place where they, they may be buried? These are questions which come up with Angkor Wat later on. Is it a sepulchral temple? Or would it be like when I say Prithvindreshwara, do I mean he is the, he is the lord of Prithvindra? More like what uh, was presented in 1948 by Ao So we have that idea very commonly present. It's particularly seen in inscriptions. For instance, the god, the linga here, the Shiva deity, in the 8th century, built by Raj, Rajasimha Pallava king, is called Rajasimheshwara. And that he's the king of Rajasimha. He's the king, he, he's sorry, the lord, the god of Rajasimha. This is a temple, you may remember, uh, Professor Julian, uh, Professor Aung, we went in uh, uh, two years back. So he's called Rajasimheshwara, the Lord of Rajasimha. 
as it would be in many of the um, so we could have two possibilities either a sepulchral or the, the linga there could be the lord of xyz uh, just a fun picture of all of us in that temple in the, not in the 8th century but two years back another meaning of course as to how the word devaraja extends is the kind of visual punning that you get in the sculptures where you have a particular deity or who, whose exploits can be explained and no one tells you it could be this king but everyone knows and Susan Hunting Huntington has said has really worked this out very beautifully in her article kings as gods gods as kings um, I don't agree with all the points she makes but at least in the visual punning of it you will know that um, a particular king who's presented there could be Vishnu or the king him earthly king so one example that we give here is the Vaikuntha Perumal temple I'll come back to this temple in a few minutes Vaikuntha is heaven and Perumal simply means God a word used for Vishnu and the temple is called Parameshwara Vinnagaram Parameshwara the Lord the highest Lord Parameshwara Parama here as the same Parama as Vishnu Lo Parama Vishnu Loka the posthumous name of Surya Varman the second Parameshwara and Vinnagaram Nagara as in Nagara as in Angkor Wat Vinnagaram is uh, the sky city the sky city but the words in the of the name itself is interesting Parameshwara Vinnagaram being very similar because it refers to the Parama Loka of Vishnu Parama Vishnu Loka which is Vaikuntha and that's the the meaning itself is embodied right here in the name of uh, the temple and this is the name that's used in poetry in the 9th and 10th centuries Tamil poetry when this particular temple was sung about why is this temple important to me because it's the only other temple I know which has three flows and is west facing uh, which is earlier I mean there are many east facing temples which Professor Branford has written about particularly the Kudalarahar temple in Madurai three to four layers and there are multiple east facing temples but only one which is west facing and three floors and has a similar sculptural program as Angkor actually so this is the temple of the Lord of Heaven in Kanchipuram, west facing and three floors um, and here inside this corridor and all around are carvings, bar reliefs and the bar reliefs would tell you the story of Vishnu different exploits of Vishnu but it also read as the life of Nandi Varman Pallavamalla and there are many this literature on this so I won't get into it I mean it was written as early as the 1940s there was a MA thesis on it in Madras again here a temple that we all went to visit it so to get back um, to the paper earlier we speak here about Devaraja the important part of the Devaraja movement is this a reinforcement of earth the area below the reinforcement the firming up of the process of this here before the below the surface uh, meaning below the heaven of the gods so I'm picking up this point which is a little different and would like to go back to this point the foundation appears as a reinforcement where similar words come up in describing the three parts of a Shiva Linga in a Purana called the Agni Purana like all our Puranas we like to keep them up to date so it starts in the 7th century but the last parts of it are 17th century but some parts of it are um, 8th 9th centuries and it's from a, uh, I'm take, I've taken this illustration from a book called Benares Region Spiritual and Cultural Guide um, and so what he says is here he quotes the Agni Purana which says from the foot up to the knee should be Brahma's portion from the knees up to the navel Vishnu and the navel up to the top should be Shiva's portion 
So the person, the portion assigned to Brahma is below the ground, but that on below the heaven, that is, um, I think you called it just, what did you call it? <coughs> the exact words were? Padekram. Yeah, Padekram, right. The Padekram is called the Pitika here, which is the this pedestal. The, ped, the pedestal which is just on the pedestal on which Vishnu resides, uh, which is very intriguing because exactly as you pointed out, in fact within two or three pages of finding this description in the secondary source, the same person who, who describes all of this goes on to talk, compare this to the people tree. Mm -hmm. So I found that kind of interesting that they make the shift so easily and so seamlessly between the linga and the people tree as containing all the gods. So this is the source of that. Bhishma gives the mantra, all honor to the people tree, the bow tree, whose roots are the form of Brahma, whose trunk is the form of Vishnu, and the upper parts are Shiva. And this is a very nice title for the book, it's called People Trees. Uh, and um, I asked David for the or origin of this and he said, you know, I tried hard to track this down, but it's, they say it's Dagni Purana, they say it's here, but it's not really anywhere. But it, never mind, it's still there. So I'm not going to read all of this, just one part. The idea that the people tree has all three gods and more, I mean, the whole family is here in the people tree, the bow tree makes it most sacred and for the people in the no in Benares and also Rajasthan it's important because it's not just the male gods but the goddesses the Shakti is there and they say for this reason he said the tree was much more powerful Shakti the tree is more powerful because it contains all this than the temple image itself than the Shivalinga or anything else so that's just another point to keep to to stir up stuff and this was simply a question. The last part here below, which whom you hadn't identified, I looked at it carefully and wondered if it was perhaps the left-hand thing was a Garuda because it's got little wings on it. Uh, can you see the little wings? Very cute, kind of like a caribbean or, you know. But, 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 what about Lakshmi? Because she is the royal consort, so to speak, figuratively and really big in terms of Shakti, in terms of having, embodying all royalty. She is called the Rajya Lakshmi. And I would like to simply throw out that par everyone's been focusing on the Deva Raja, but parallel to this, if you'd only recognize it, is the churning of the ocean of milk story. Equally important conceptually, in terms of rituals, in terms, and, and con continuing till today both in terms of its numerous meanings as well as for its um, um, the, the ritual. So here we have in the same place that you've been drawing a lot of work from and Eric Portano has been drawing, we have the Lakshmi. Notice on both sides you find the elephant, the Gaja Lakshmi. That's why she's called the Gaja Lakshmi here. So you find the elephant and what are the elephants doing? They're anointing her. And if you go back to the Vishnu Purana, they'll tell you they got waters from the Ganges, they got it from every other river, the Mississippi, whatever, ever, and they kind of anointed her. And that is important. That ritual of anointing is the exact moment when that king is made a king. That's the transformation moment. And it's still done in rituals in temples, where when they recite the, the origin, the Purusha Sutta hymn, the water is poured over the, uh, the deity's head. And that ritual, which you find, is so significant that here, by the way, here's Lakshmi again in the churning of the ocean of milk coming out. But she is the Raja Lakshmi, and I would argue that equally important as the Devaraja is the concept of the Raja Lakshmi, of whom, by which she's known everywhere. Um, and you find that ritual of the anointing even now. I mean, any, anyone who's been to Sam Reap has seen this, surely. Um, you know, the anointing of the waters with the waters on the head. Um, moving on, this is of course a 
Koker Sadashiva had found and the Yama and Koker transiting to Professor Ang's paper. Um, questions on timing. You spoke about the fortnight of the dead. And I would like to argue here that yes, this, the rituals survive in India. It's not a time, it, and the p same time period, we have corresponded on this before. It is the fortnight before the new moon, which comes between September and October. Um, it's called the Pitru Paksha, the fortnight of the dead, of the ancestors. The difference, of course, is in the Hindus, you only do it to your own ancestors, not to everyone, like you do it in Cambodia. But it's this very, very same fortnight in which you offer this, and this was done in the exact same Paksha period in, by the Hindu immigrant, cent central even in Trinidadian Hinduism. However, look, the, the concept I would like to argue that while Yama is so significant in Cambodia, the god of death dies in India. And why? Because his name is not invoked. His he's just not there. So, moving to another idea, twins. Yama, you began your story with the stories of twins, Yama and Yami. And last night when I jet lagged, I was thinking about a ritual that um, my friend Bun Sokon had told me uh, that this was a ritual that was common in some of the rural areas in Cambodia. And he says, and this morning he wrote me saying, well, not too many people do it, maybe we because we're uncivilized. And I said, no, I mean, that's important. And he said when he had twins, uh, he called them Vishnu and Lakme. And he said, well, that's all you, th those are the only time, this was in 2005. And he told me that when they were a few months old, they have a ritual in, in which they're united, and it's almost like they're doing a, a wedding for them. And he said that's because they wanted to be together, un, unse inseparable in their earlier lives. But now we do the ritual just so, saying that they're euphemistically, I mean, get married. And this is, uh, he calls, calls this the twins' wedding. And that, that's how we do the ritual itself. <coughs> and he said, we call it, it's something like, they wanted, they wished to get married in the past life, so in this life we have to celebrate them um, by, you know, doing that, by respecting that. Last point before I just conclude, wrap it up. Yama is better understood in South Asia as with the other name you spoke about, Dharma, which is a different form of justice, not the beating up of people. But even though Yama doesn't, it's the kinkaras. By the way, I love the word kinkara. Really archaic, but it's so, um, what shall I say, sectarian in India. Only associated with a certain kind of love. Ki l the word kinkaria means loving service coming from kin kinkaromi. And so a servant is called kinkara, but it's not a servant, it's loving service. It's Kim, what will I do? What will I do? What can I do next? What can I do next? So <laughs> you can see them panting, wanting to help people. But Yama is understood better as Dharma, the, ra the king of Dharma. In the in one form, yes, that is justice. Of course, it's righteousness. But here, it's, it's in the more exalted sense, I would say. More as a dharma of who teaches Nachiketas in uh, the Shweta Shotara Upanishad. He gives ideas, he, he gives a boon to this young boy Nachiketas and, and, and he says, I, I want to know knowledge, I mean the real knowledge, the real stuff, the good stuff. And he keeps, Yama tries to send him away in, the, in this Upanishad and he co comes back until he pushes him for the supreme knowledge which will make him immortal. And so Yama here becomes more the concept of Dharma, whose son embodies Dharma, and he's called the son of Dharma. And so that's Yudhishthira in the five Pandava scene here in Angkor Wat. And sitting right next to Bhishma, getting all the um, uh, lectures on Dharma, 
justice and that's recorded and that becomes part of the Dharma Shastra for us in the Mahabharata. Okay, concluding point. Yes, Yama is here. And yes, this is also a place of royal kingship. Surya Varman, who faces south, right next to all those panels on Yama. I took this from the hot air balloon, by the way, which goes up. Mm -hmm. So, on one of those days when it was even working. Uh, but notice all around it. This picture was not mine, it was given by Bureth. Um, but notice the moat around it. And it's more than just a palace moat. The descriptions of Vaikuntha in many of the texts speak of it as being surrounded by a river. It's an island in the middle of a river. And the island in the middle of a river is surrounded by a river called Viraja without passion. And once you cross there, you reach Vaikuntha, par that is Parama Vishnu Loka. The supreme abode of Vishnu is Vaikuntha, which is surrounded by this river. And the word Parama Vishnu Loka, of course, is connected not just with Surya Varman on the one hand, the posthumous title, but also with the name of the temple I spoke about earlier, Vaikuntha Perumal Temple, Parameshwara Vinnagaram. That is the Nagara, Nagar, which is in the sky, which is the highest one, and therefore Vaikuntha. So would it be, and it's a question, that a place which has so much of Yama and so much of death on the south-facing side is yet a place which conquers that death in a very subtle way, not in a harsh way of destruction, but where, yes, Yama has its place, but those who worship this God, and this is going to the spiritual part of it, get to be in Vaikuntha. Thank you once again. Thank you. And once again, many, many thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Okay, now you have a hard act to follow. So. <laughs> you want to, maybe you guys should come up to the front because we're also going to have open up to the audience. So. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, who wants to begin? Uh, me. Okay, thank you. You know, this morning in the train we discussed about this and that, about everything, and uh, I said to uh, Gregory that uh, what we lack in Cambodia in the uh, teaching of linguistic, what we lack is what is called historical phonetic. But I mean, if someone teach us the Khmer historical phonetic, I am sure that uh, I said Kingara because I just uh, read, you know, uh, the trans transliteration. I am sure that in ancient Cambodia they pronounce King. Today it is pronounced Kang. But uh, what what differs today from uh, ancient time is that the uh, Kingara are no more understood as you know, the torturer, the, the nowadays we talk about Takan, as if he is only one person acting like a kind of a guardian. When you, the, the you know, I, I showed it an image on the making of the rice ball around 8 uh, in the evening. Pinda. 8 o'clock. Uh, the Pinda. Pinda, Pinda. And uh, people just whisper in that time, you know. They ask, this is kind of a versification, not very long. And uh, they ask Takang, grandfather Tinkara, uh, only one person, to, to prevent because Takan is believed to have a, a dog, a fierce dog. But in Indian, in ancient time, in Indian tradition, it is a Yama who has a, 
to even to drop I think. But nowadays it is understood that King Dara has a dog. And uh, when we we uh, make the rice ball, the pinda, we ask Takang, Grandfather Kang, to, uh, how to say, to tie up the dog. Yeah, to tie up the dog so that uh, they can bring all the, the, the pinda to the, the dead people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. Yes, nowadays King Dara is understood as uh, only one person and not a direct uh, torturer, but kind of guardian of the abode of uh, Yama. About uh, twin <laughs> brother and sister, I, 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 I have no explanation, but uh, you know in our version of uh, Vesantara Jataka, mm -hmm. of the, the last Vataku Jataka, yeah. now we are in a, a Buddhist uh, domain. Uh, in our version, uh, Vesantara has two children, one daughter, Chili Krishna. Chili is a uh, male, Krishna female. And uh, back to the back from the forest to the, uh, the palace, they started with the uh, halberlung, with uh, you know uh, gathering the soul, etc. But uh, followed by the marriage, the wedding of the Chidi and Krishna. Mm. So this shows that it is is uh, rooted in in our culture, culture. But I have no explanation. I I know other tradition uh, related to uh, to. Uh, 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 that one I have no uh, explanation. And what more uh, was about the time uh, you said that the, in India, the, the yes, of course, I think that the principle of uh, superior has uh, worked deeply on this question. The, the principle of uh, the, the fortnight of the death is uh, Shraddha in yes. India. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we have at least one inscription from uh, Yashovama from mm -hmm. early 10th century. Uh, we can see uh, very, very clearly that uh, the root of the, the, our fortnight of the dead is... Uh, and uh, it happened that uh, this inscription dates back from the 10th century, but uh, I mean tradition and belief uh, may uh, mm -hmm. have existed uh, in uh, earlier time. Of, of course, uh, the, the basic idea is Ustraka. As you mentioned, the first uh, scholar who uh, have translated that inscription was uh, Auguste Bach in the year 1880-something. And uh, what struck him is the fact that in India, like you uh, said, uh, it is meant to uh, to only your family and maybe in three generations. Uh, maybe seven if you push it. But in Cambodia, anyone. anyone. Uh, yeah, about uh, the importance of Lakshmi. I didn't mention it, but on the, we, we believe that it began to be clearly linked with the, let's say, the Deva Raja, uh, starting from the 12th century and the Brayan belief. Because Lakshmi, that is to say Shri, is linked with the sword of the king. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind, we think that there's a kind of uh, reconfiguration of the figure of the, of the goddess between Shri and Lakshmi. Uh, linked to the the both regalia, that is the sword, and shakti, that is the spear. Uh, because inside the palace, you got two regalia, the sword, always associated with Shri, especially in the 14th century, in the inscription of Bantu Israel, K568 and K569, uh, we can see that uh, the making of the king is directly linked to uh, the uh, to the wedding with the uh, the girl of the 
to the daughter of the king and the fact that uh, he kept the sword of the king. It's linked. Uh, and the, the name of the princess is, uh, in the name of the king, is Shri Shrindra Varma. Mm. And the replication of the Shri here, Shri for king is Roman, but Shri Shrindra Varma, we assume that it is linked with the wedding with the princess and with uh, the fact that uh, the young king, which at the beginning was Yuvaraja, Yuvariyaj, uh, got the sword from the king. Uh, that is for the, and after that, there's a clear association, even in Sukhothai, between uh, the, 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 the sword of the king and uh, the Shri, it's Jaya Shri. Mm. Um, that is for Lakshmi. And for, uh, let's say, Uma, or uh, the goddess associated to the sacrifice of the buffaloes, we got the spear. The spear, which is a second regalia uh, stored in the bronze pavilion in the palace of Phnom Penh. And of course, <coughs> the people who are killing the buffalo on the, by, on the barrel of Bayon are using a spear. Uh, and, but when, maybe I'm going too far, but uh, the uh, how do you say that? Um, the origin of the spear in the late stories uh, uh, always uh, are always going to uh, the place of the uh, of the people who are in charge of the cult of the white lady of the center of the of the kingdom, Mesopotamia. So we think, there is, we think that there is a, a, a real relation between Shakti and the spear and Shri, Lakshmi and the sword uh, of the king. At least at starting uh, with this 12th century and so on. Okay, I think all of us have talked enough. Um, it's your turn. Uh, just a brief question. Um, cremations in, um, in Cambodia, are they restricted to, um, or are they open to everybody, or are they restricted to certain types of people as they are in, in northern India? In, other, in a sense that you can't, can't um, cremate a pregnant woman, you don't cremate children, you don't cremate, yeah, cremate girls, you don't cremate a priest, you don't create. Uh, can they, um, there's lots of categories, mm -hmm. you know, mental people uh, with mental illness, so you can't, uh, is, is, it, is that the case in, in Cambodia? We get traditionally, you know, nowadays uh, many things are changing, but uh, traditionally uh, uh, that person uh, died in uh, Someone who uh, had committed suicide, yes. for example, okay, yeah. cannot be cremated with the order. Right. But that custom still exists today in some rural village. I, I, I can, I can, uh, I, 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 I witness that. <coughs> it is said that uh, uh, below 10 years old, we do not cremate traditionally. But I think today we can make the uh, everyone. But uh, it, it is possible that uh, in some area they still uh, observe the, the this custom. And uh, uh, not only uh, among Cambodian, but among ethnic minority also. I I see a tomb of uh, a maybe a, a, a person with uh, under ten year old uh, age. Uh, his body was not uh, buried with all the other but the car. Uh, so uh, we, we have an, uh, a word and expression or to, to, how to, say, to qualify the, the, the death in an abnormal uh, you, you, you know, a, a, a normal a normal death is that the person 
reach the cycle from birth. Uh, uh, we, 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 we are born, we grow up, we get old and we die. This is the normal cycle. But if you, at uh, 30 years of age, you die because you have a, uh, an accident in a river or you commit suicide, this is considered, the, the death was considered as a, uh, the, the dead person is called, was called at least, Khmer Chai, which means because the because the cycle is not rich. Yeah, my question is for Dr. McKelly. I thought your <coughs> sorry, your presentation was fascinating. Uh, um, I thought you used a very interesting word to describe um, the operation of of Deva Raja on the the earth below. You used the word firming. I'm wondering, is there a reason behind your choice of that word as opposed to other words that are usually used to describe rule, as in like um, imposing order or expanding or causing something to happen? I mean, is there a link between firming and uh, discourses in inscriptions that you are trying to link to? Um, or um, like what is the implication of, of that word versus you know the other words that are normally used? And also, I think, I think Penny mentioned something like, uh, whether whether that firming process is only uh, an accosted thing from above to below, or whether there is any mutual uh, firming uh, between the right below and the, the, the top. So the first reason is that it was a translation of a French word. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, which, which, is to, which is to say, sorry, I have to intervene here because I. <laughs> partially irresponsible. Um, so affirm would be a firm. distinct translation, but firm, the way that you're using the term, is also very, um, very, very distinctly relating to that question of to make firm, right? So, uh, so the, the, um, the point is that at that time appear a Cambodian word to say things. For example, say crown. So uh, what we are trying to say is that at that time a new expression is coming to describe the earth below, to describe the, the earth below. So uh, that's the point. Second point is that, uh, as I said uh, before, um, why is, is this appearing now and not before and not after? It's maybe that the hypothesis that there is a changement of scale in the society. The society is being more complex, uh, typically in the Korki period, with um, uh, how do you say that? a broader complexification in the status of the of the elite, for example, with more titles. So uh, we we have not the same societies as one cycle or two cycles before. That's why we are trying to use this vocabulary, which is a quite uh, general vocabulary used by other. Or historian in other societies <coughs> to describe general change in the society, uh, general change of scale of the other society. Okay, thank you. But uh, why we are choosing this uh, this period uh, to to begin the process is because we have the expression in the inscription. Before not. I have a question for Professor Ong, it's about Vienna. You really retreat very well the different appellations that Vienna have had throughout time, starting with the Guardian of the South region, Regents of the South, Church of the Dead, God of Rebirth, and particularly Good Reincarnation, and King of Good, as it was found in one of the sorts of the nationals of the Canberra. But you said today that um, to guarantee Good Reincarnation, a good funeral is, is very much um, in place, and the Acha can help you get into organizing a good ritual. What happens then at the site of the ritual between the Acha and the altar, Yama's altar? Does Yama confer one of his power to the Acha? Does the Acha get the sort of power to 
to negotiate with Yama on the uh, final destiny of the school, whether it will be well reincarnated or not. In which case, do you have a, a sort of um, transmission of power from Yama, who is here quite close to the humans, in the same way as uh, you've mentioned that the uh, Minister of Justice until the 1950s was called Onya Yomare. Does that mean that at court, then this person, the judge, the Minister of Justice, is the one who gets the power of Nyama, the king of order, actually, uh, to be able to um, make cases and, and be just and uh, right towards the, the people who, who are being governed and, and taken in front of the court? I, I leave the answer of uh, Yomare to uh, the other, uh, Onya Yomare, but I mean, uh, you know, first, uh, in I'm, I'm always talking about the Onko area because this is the only one zone I, I, I know. In the Onko area, you cannot become Aja without the the official approval, not, not official, uh, you know, administratively speaking. But I mean, you have to uh, receive clearly consensus from uh, people from villagers, but uh, and after that, you must receive a kind of uh, uh, acknowledgement, official acknowledgement, called upside, like uh, when you become a king, you know, uh, 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 a aja uh, has to be, and uh, to to become, you know, there are uh, five people. The main aja you. you so in the, it's called your P, you know, the main, and uh, he is uh, followed by four four other aja. But the, the main aja is him, the aja your P. Uh, 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 it has to be someone. These people uh, have been of course once at least in uh, their life uh, uh, with this man. Yeah? Uh, he has to be someone who su ha has succeeded in the kind of uh, meditation called Thua Knong Thua Smit, and you know, a meditation from uh, a, a bit uh, esoteric, not not really, uh, not really, uh, in, not really uh, following. Uh, orthodox or classical uh, Buddhist uh, teaching, you know, you have to have a long experience in and successful in the meditation, meditation on the not not the uh, meditation on the esoteric uh, subject to to become that ajna and. Uh, As I said, uh, the, uh, the the Ajya I, I show in the, the slide, uh, he believed, he really believed that he is, a, because uh, um, when you, when you uh, operate, when you, in the cremation uh, ritual, you know, the Ajya has to, have with him the banner of the soul. Each each uh, dead person has a banner of the soul called Tung uh, His name is inscribed, the name of the, the dead person. Because this is like a, you know, ID card for the afterlife. Yeah, it is that. And sometimes in, in uh, some villages, the, the name of the Aja, the name of the official is uh, put on because it is believed that uh, once in the once uh, in front of the Yomrit, the Yomrit can see who, who who was the res who was responsible of the cremation. If he uh, when he uh, uh, see that uh, it is a uh, uh, girl, for example, ah okay. Uh, this uh, this man is a very uh, uh, 
so um, so you know the the concern of people uh, in that context has nothing moral, nothing, nothing moral, nothing religious. But uh, really, uh, you know, we look for a way to. You know, we ignore uh, the, the, the notion of <coughs> karma, karma and parna, uh, the, 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 the relation between the, uh, the action in the past and the, the, the condition you are living now, etc. All that is forgotten. I know I heard, saw some hands up earlier that have now been tucked under. Do you put maybe just to precise things about Yomaraja, Yomari, uh -huh. as a Minister of Justice. Right. Uh, we are lacking documents, but we have another example. Uh, for example, Kralahau. As you know, there are five ministers Chavir, Yomari, Veang Chakrai, and Kralahau. Kralahau, if you stick with the definition, the colonial definition, it is a ministry of, uh, let's say, uh, maritime affairs, uh, of maritime affairs, let's say so. But if you, if you see the, the postal current documentation, it is a ministry in charge of war, first of all. Why? Uh, because the, the answer is in the name, Perlahau. So it might mean I'm speaking in the, under the control of Professor Angelin, but the area dedicated to the Homa, the sacrifice, the fire sacrifice before going to war. Mm -hmm. uh, and Adema Leclerc has a clear description when the minister of Lahom is in charge of some ritual practices uh, in the... Uh, mm -hmm. The cutting of the, the rope uh, at uh, in the festival of the water, he is the one mm. who is in charge to cut the the rope. The, 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 the line. To cut the line. So uh, maybe the Yomarit has some ritual functions too in the post Korean period. We will not know, but in the colonial period, it was off, mm. as far as I know. All right, well, um, I think we deserve a drink, and please do remember that we are um, Thank you we're promoting various things next door, books and, uh, and uh, support for culture and research, this sort of thing, so please do join us next door. And thank you very much to our speakers and our respondents, and thank you all.